Sound for Thought, a podcast that explores what the point of making music is. Today's guest is John Pagliasati of Delta Dagger. You may also know him as the guitarist for IV mega band Savage Henry. John is a super nice guy, some would say the nicest guy ever, and he's got lots of cool things to say about music. I'm really happy I got to catch up with him and have a really cool conversation. We talked about his new home studio setup in Slow, the way his parents introduced him to good music at a young age, including a pretty fun story about the Best of Bowie album cover. We also talked about the difference between Savage Henry and Delta Dagger as musical outlets for him. We talked about Legos, the Ivy music scene. He gives his take on what the Ivy music scene is and kind of how it was to be a part of. And also, we talk about something called Simpsons Wave, and I can't really describe that better than he can, so you'll just have to wait for his description. And also so much more. Of course, most importantly, John explains why he makes music with a very serious and heartfelt answer, and also a very silly, funny joke answer, both of which may change your life. One quick note, in the interview, I mispronounced the name of Max Collier. Not for the first time, I said Max Collier like a dumb American, and so I send my apologies to Max, but I'm going to ask Aiden, who's going to edit this episode, to fix it in post and add in the correct pronunciation. Everyone should go listen to Max's music and follow the haunts. You can also hear his interview on this show, Sound for Thought. He is episode six. Go check it out. It's worth it. He's a cool guy too. Some other Redefining Records content that I have to promote to you today. We have a written series on our website, redefiningrecords.com, called Sound to Visual, where we analyze music videos and basically kind of dissect the visuals and the lyrics and the music and try to find super deep and sometimes obscure and vague meaning that's not actually there, but it's really fun. We recently released one that I wrote covering the new Judd Zingle project video for Old School Tribe. So go to our website and check that out, give it a read, watch the video, it's super cool. You can find me, Andrew Schultz, on Spotify. My username is Schultz Andrew, one word, S-H-U-L-T-S-A-N-D-R-E-W to find all of the Redefining Records playlist. There's one called Under the Radar, which is a bunch of new releases that I kind of put together, tried to make it pretty eclectic, but it's mostly indie stuff, but all new. There's also one called Cult Members Only, which is a bunch of original music from our cult members. Go check that out for sure. There's also a playlist for this podcast called Sound for Thought, the playlist. It has all the originals from our guest and all the music they mention in their episode. Still working on that one, though. It's incomplete. And finally, the last playlist you should check out is called Soundtrack to Your Life, which corresponds to the game Soundtrack to Your Life, which we play on the show. If you've been following the last few episodes, you know we've been playing this game at the end of the episode where basically the guest pretends they're in a movie, I describe a scene to them, and then they tell me what song would be playing in the background if their life was a movie in this scenario. It's super fun, and so basically I've been keeping track of all the answers that the guests have been giving and putting them in this playlist. You can follow John Delta Dagger on Instagram at Delta Dagger Music and find his music everywhere that DistroKid will distribute it to. Mainly, for most people, that'll be Spotify. For the real hardcore fans, go find his band camp. You can actually find a bonus song on his band camp. Before we dig into the interview, first up, we're going to listen to his original song, Daft Drunk. John actually tells the whole story about how he put this song together and kind of what he was trying to do with this song about halfway through the episode. So hearing it now, 
will give you better context for that story. Please enjoy. John, what's up? What up, dude? How's it going, Andrew? It's going really well. I'm excited to be talking to you today. How are you doing? Uh, doing all right, man. It was a uh, it was a long day, good hard day's work, and uh, I'm stoked to be kicking back at the uh, at the Delta Dagger uh, recording studio right now, talking to you. Sick. That's awesome. Where Where do you work now? I'm curious. Uh, I work at Enterprise Rent a Car. I'm a branch manager down in Lompoc. Um, so making the commute, uh, the studio, also uh, known as my house, is in San Luis Obispo. So I'm making the commute as of now, but get a company car, so it's not too bad of a gig. That's good. I would hope that Enterprise would provide you with a car. It's the least they could do, right? It really is. Um, it sounds good, though. Do you enjoy it? Yeah, it's good stuff, man. It's uh, I always tell people, man, music is steady work. It puts the bread on the table, but running cars is my passion. <laughs> oh my gosh, that, <laughs> now that's good stuff. Um, so tell me a little bit about your studio space, then. Uh, my studio space uh is basically uh a desk that I got at IKEA, uh, and my laptop, which is a uh. Let me go into the preferences here uh, about this Mac. Uh, it is a 13-inch uh, MacBook mid-2012. Uh, wow. And then I have a uh, Focusrite Scarlett uh, deal uh, direct uh, what, uh, interface, rather, that I record with. Um, I have a couple microphones that I liberated out of a car while I was work. Maybe redact that. Uh, I found some <laughs> microphones uh, that I use. It's a cheap set. Uh, I forget MXL makes them, and I've only just started playing with those. And then I've got a uh, SM57, of course, which I have been using less and less. I really like. I have a Sure, uh, or sorry, Sennheiser. Uh, what Sennheiser E806 or something like that. It's it's supposed to be for vocals, like a live vocal mic. But I've been using it to track. Uh, 
acoustic guitar, vocals, other stuff, and it sounds really good. So nice. uh, that's what I'm rocking. I'm recording most of, actually, all of my electric guitar tones now are direct in to the computer, and I'm using the free version of, uh, what's it called, Bias Amp that came with the the Focus Right. I'm looking to upgrade. It's it's decent. Um, bass tones are direct in. Keys uh, are MIDI. Drums are mostly programmed, although I have Will Heddle working on some live drums for me. Uh, so really the only thing I have to mic up is acoustic guitar and vocals. So it's, uh, it's a pretty compact, easy rig uh, to travel with. I was down in Santa Barbara last uh, weekend recording Mr. Ben Sealhammer. He did an oud solo for me for uh, my upcoming single. So I got to bring the, the mics and my interface and my laptop. We just plugged in and did it right there in his house. And it's super easy uh yeah it's good stuff yeah it sounds great um when can we expect to hear that single you mentioned uh spring is uh is as accurate as i'm willing to be on that (laughs) okay i'm gonna hold you to that it better be out in spring do please do because the last thing the last music thing i wanted to release i like said i was gonna release it and then i like as i was mixing it i grew to hate it so much that i never released (laughs) it but I'm going to release it. I'm, it's probably like along with the single, I'm probably just going to do it. Yeah, you got to just, uh, it's hard to set those deadlines and stick to them. But we try. Exactly. So I want to take a rewind and basically start by delving into your history, kind of learn a little bit about how you grew up in terms of musical experiences like how soon did you start playing music what kind of music did you grow up listening to in the house and that sort of thing like were your parents musicians yeah so so uh my dad uh plays the drums and he played drums in in uh, a couple cover bands when he was in high school and college i know his college band was called uh legal tender which is kind of a cool name and so they did just like kind of cover stuff and that was pretty cool but yeah he always had his uh his kid out in the garage and he would go bang on that and i remember when i was really little he had like an acoustic kit and um eventually upgraded to a a very early e-kit which was sick he still has that little board and then he's he's got an even another e-kit now uh, that he still bangs on from time to time so yeah he's he's super about music always supported my music um my mom uh, was a dancer for a long time. She uh, was a Rams cheerleader and then at one point was the head choreographer of all the dancing at Disneyland. So wow. uh, maybe, you know, not a musician herself, but very, uh, you know, adjacent to music for her whole career and uh, very supportive of stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, no, like growing up, there was always um, music in the house and stuff like I, I still have uh, a lot of memories of going out into the garage and my dad would be wrenching on something and uh, he always had his uh, his little radio going it's typically 955 KLOS or something like that you know just that kind of uh you know late 70s 80s kind of just rock you know um and to this day when i'm wrenching on something it always feels right to have like some thin lizzy playing or something you know bob seger or something like that um so he always had that on um and other stuff, uh, K Jazz 88.1. I would always hear that on the radio. My buddy's grandpa would play that when he drove us home from school. And, and, uh, so, you know, I had all those sweet Southern California radio stations and stuff. Uh, and then one, one big moment for me musically, when I, I, I say this is kind of the mo- moment I started listening to real music, like seriously listening to it, um, is my parents had a, a uh, like a tower of CDs, you know, like one of those big uh, just single s- single column towers of CDs. I don't know if you remember those, but uh, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like everybody's parents probably had those at at one point. Um, so they, I was going through the big tower, and I I was just looking at the album covers. I wasn't even you know processing what it was. And I remember I took one out, and I was looking at it, and I was just like so. Uh, stricken by what it was and it was i don't know if you've seen this but do you know it's a greatest hits compilation called best of bowie are you have you seen this i'm not i'm not familiar with the cover now yeah, it's super no nah, it's yeah it's it's a it's basically if it's a collage right it's bowie's face and it's like a collage and it's like you know his left eye is like cut out of this picture of bowie 
and then like his right eye is cut out of like another picture of Bo- like you know it's like this super yeah, yeah. weird looking collage and i was just like staring at it like what is this and i was like mom like what is this and she's like that's david bowie like you want to listen to david bowie i was like yeah so she like put it in her uh dodge grand caravan and i was like a little kid like rolling around with like bowie and then i like went back to the the cd thing because i really liked the bowie and i found another one which was the beatles uh one another greatest hits one it's the red one with the yellow one yeah yeah Um, yeah that's a little more people know that one so that was like the next one and then my mom was like oh well you should check out uh like here's queen and like here's like electric lights orchestra so she started like showing me all this crazy shit you know so that i mean so from a pretty early age i was like into some cool music i guess you know definitely i just looked up the uh cover for the bowie album it's definitely trippy it's trippy right it's very bowie yeah it is very bowie yeah it's for the viewers at home if you're in a safe place you should uh look it up real quick (laughs) yeah i love the idea of like discovering music based off of the artwork too i mean that was obviously a huge thing in the past and it's kind of lost now but it's still like such a fun thing to like pick something up and be like what is this it looks weird it looks cool right exactly and that's it you're right because it's uh you know at least with cds you could emulate kind of the uh the experience of picking up an lp right and picking up an lp it's gigantic it's really big so you get to really look at the art cd at least it was still a physical medium you could still do that you know like i'm really lucky i had that um you know i don't know if it would have had the same effect although kids kids probably years from now are gonna be like yeah dude i remember like my ipod touch and you could like (laughs) scroll through the album covers it was so cool like you know yeah i kind of feel like that a little bit you're right no it's kind of true um that's cool though when did you start actually playing music yourself so I started playing guitar when I was in like, uh, like fifth or sixth grade or something. Um, mm, yeah, probably around then thereabouts, um, started taking, uh, lessons at a local, uh, music conservatory, me and my brother. And, uh, eventually my brother, uh, switched to just bass instead of guitar. And then he just kind of quit altogether. And I continued with lessons. I took lessons for about like, I don't know, maybe two or three years, um, up and up into like, I guess, middle school era. Uh, and then I kind of stopped. Um, but I kept playing guitar. There was never a, a point in there where I, I'd set down the guitar. Um, I just kind of stopped lessons, uh, and then just kind of figured it out on my own from there. So yeah, yeah, like fifth end of end of end of elementary school, I guess, is when I started playing guitar. Gotcha. Was there like a certain band or album that kind of triggered you to be like, I need to learn how to play this guitar right now so I can play this song or something? Yep. That was uh that was when my buddy showed me uh <clears throat> I forget if it was Zeppelin 2 or if it was uh, like a best of Zeppelin or something, yeah. but I'm pretty sure or no, I guess it would have been Zeppelin 1 because it was I think it was Communication Breakdown. It was it was one of the early Zeppelin songs is what it, the album as a whole, I think, did it for me. But there was probably one specific song in there if I traveled back in time that I could find. Yeah, that's a good one. It's a good yeah. album good few albums i should say Uh, right i'm just doing shotgun i'll name them all and uh and someone will be happy yeah i mean you can't be upset upset. (laughs) so let's see so i actually asked around a few of our mutual friends some uh to see if they had any suggestions for questions i should ask you so i'm gonna hit you with a couple of uh requests for questions here can i guess who no i don't want to guess who requested that's too hard but yeah i'm interested to hear these (laughs) yeah okay here we go um well this is a lot of them like overlapped with questions that i already wanted to ask you so i was happy that they said some of these but we'll start with uh max collier or golden sign uh if you prefer um he wants to know What does Delta Dagger offer you as a musical outlet in comparison to Savage Henry? That's a great question. Um, And uh, depending on the the song choice you did might play into my explanation of the song choice too. But uh, uh, 
No, that's a wonderful question. So <clears throat> Savage Henry was really cool because I was just lead guitar. So I got to focus purely on writing my guitar parts and coming up with leads that complemented the song and the uh, chord progressions and, and really honing that skill. It was yeah. also really fun because uh, it was fun to bring my songs to a band and see them kind of come to life. Um, when I write songs, I typically think about all the different parts in my head. Uh, so it was interesting to bring them to the band and see how it came alive in real life as opposed to in my head. And uh, Savage Trainer was cool in that other people would bring music to me and I could I could do things to it. You know, I could add to it and and change it even a little bit or just, you know, I got to see those things develop. And it was a ton of fun not being totally uh, on my own coming up with everything myself. It was a really cool exercise to have like a totally different sound, something I never would have written, come in and be like, this is yours now. Like you're going to write a guitar part for this and then just go with it. Like it was super fun in that regard too. Um, <clears throat> Delta dagger, uh, then conversely, uh, satisfies the part in me that likes to, um, be the control freak. So instead of, bringing the song to the band and the parts that I imagine in my head are gone now. Uh, and it's changed into the real thing, which is really awesome. I get to do the other awesome thing, which is now all of those sounds are going to be exactly replicated in real life. And I get to hear them in real life now and not just in my head. So two very different things, but very fulfilling in two very different ways. Um, so, you know, aside from the complete creative control over it, it also, I think lets me uh, explore <clears throat> musical preferences that I have that are uh, different than what we did in, in Savage Henry. So Savage Henry, uh, pretty straightforward kind of classic rock, uh, sound. We incorporated some jazzy sounds too at times and kind of a little more progressive, interesting kind of jam bandy type stuff too. Uh, but it was pretty, uh, pretty not necessarily pigeonholed, but there was, there was a genre to that band. And, and I noticed I was writing songs uh, that were <clears throat> not of that genre. And a couple of them I brought to the band and we kicked them around at practice for a while. And I could tell some of them just didn't really stick, you know? So I would kind of like file those away. And that's kind of what became the first Delta Dagger album is like kind of these songs I had written that are not quite Savage Henry, but I still want to do something with them. I'm not just going to like throw them away. Like they're still cool and, uh, but they're just different. So I'm going to record them now. And so that's, there's Delta dagger. Yeah. Gotcha. That's a really good way of explaining it. Definitely see kind of the difference between just working on your own versus collaborating in terms of musical output and stuff. So here's a, another one from Max. Mm -hmm. He wants to know, uh, who are your songwriting inspirations? Songwriting inspirations. So uh, right now, I would say musically, uh, where I'm drawing from would be <clears throat> kind of the, uh, well, kind of two places. Like one would be kind of the uh, DIY rock scene of, uh, you know, somebody like Mac DeMarco or whatever. And then the other would be kind of the, uh, prog scene of guys like, like Chon or like Covet or something. So I'm like, not that good at guitar as those guys. Uh, but I'm like trying to incorporate some of those vibes into kind of a chill, uh, you know, alternative pop kind of DIY vibe too. Um, the first record I think was a little more pop oriented and the second record is going to be a little more like musically interesting, I think. Um, but yeah, kind of, kind of those two areas is what I'm drawing for. And I'm also not being afraid to include like little electronic bits and stuff too. Cause I love radio head and stuff. Like they do all their acoustic instruments and then incorporate a vintage drum machine or something. It's just cool. I like incorporating little stuff like that too. Yeah. That's a really nice kind of blend of sounds and, and influences that you got there. And I think yeah. you are as good of a guitar player as them. Oh no, oh, don't say that. No. <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to put high expectations on you all the time. Uh, yeah, there you go. Then I have to live up to them. It's like the release date too for the album. <laughs> yep. I'm just, I'm just going to be just a, like a, 
like a nag for you. You're, you're not going to want to talk to me anymore after this. <laughs> <laughs> That's good though. I need it. Okay. Last question from Max. He wants to know how are you the nicest person ever? <laughs> it's uh, it's all just tricks, Max. It's all just a, it's all just a show. The ultimate stage presence is off the stage. There you go. You heard it from the man himself. Okay. <laughs> Here's a couple questions. Uh, these were kind of combined. I talked to Robert Sandless and also Aiden Danzi. They both kind of said the same things, but this is something I want to talk about too. Basically, we all know you kind of have a passion for building guitars yourself. So we want to hear a little bit about how you got into that and maybe what some of the things you've learned from that process is. Absolutely. Um so yeah, that, uh, the way I got into that is, um, I had, I had, uh, played a couple different guitars with Savage Henry, uh, started on a Strat, <clears throat> didn't like it, moved to a Les Paul, liked it a lot, missed a couple elements of the Strat. So I started looking for a guitar that had the elements I liked of the Les Paul and the elements I liked of the Strat and other little features that I wanted in a guitar and I couldn't find one. Um, yeah, I really couldn't find one. So basically I started compiling, uh, parts to build this guitar. By the time I got all the parts together, I realized that I had spent way too much money on the parts to trust myself to build this guitar. So I took it to my longtime guitar tech down here in Fountain Valley. That's Mr. Joel Grant. You guys should check him out if you're in SoCal and uh, need any guitar work done. I took it to him. He put it together for me. So that was kind of my first halfway. I, I designed a guitar, but I didn't build it. Gotcha. Uh, the next one, because uh, I thought about that for a while. I was like, well, now I need to do it. Um, so the next one kind of fell into my lap. I had this uh, roommate... I guess this was what my uh, junior, sophomore, junior year of college, um, living in IV, and uh, we had this uh, roommate from Australia, Jonah, and he played uh, ukulele and banjo and tenor guitar. Uh, and as we lived together, I started showing him guitar, guitar, and uh, he picked up this, I mean, cheap Squire Affinity Stratocaster that he was learning on, and then he was like, "Well, I'm going back to Australia and." it wouldn't even be worth the money to ship this back. You can just have it. I'm going to go home and buy a nice guitar. You just, you can just have this thing, dude, do something crazy with it. So I was like, okay. And so I threw a uh, Seymour Duncan JB and a Seymour Duncan jazz humbucker in it. Uh, I spray painted it matte orange. Uh, and then I, I wired it up kind of like a Gibson with a, a three-way switch and a volume knob for each uh, pickup and a master tone. Uh, and that was like that orange guitar that I used with Savage Henry for a long time. That's you can hear that guitar on the second record. The second record, that whole thing's done with that orange guitar into my quilter amplifier uh, and almost no effects pedals. Um, first record was done on the guitar that Joel built for me, actually, for most of it. That and my Les Paul. Um, so that's how I built that guitar. Um, basically, out of necessity, I wanted to do something crazy like Jonah wanted me to do, and I wanted to. Um, just build like a beater guitar you know the first guitar again it was like i put some money into it and we're playing these backyards in iv and like you know you know how it is man you get beer spilled all over your stuff and it was like dude this guitar is like too nice so i <laughs> took out like the spray painted one right that was like the iv guitar yeah um and then more recently i uh, put together a strat i'm looking at it right now it's sitting right there and it's actually the neck off of the old iv guitar because i put a new neck on that i put that neck on this guitar the body is from my very first strat uh and just it, it kind of put it together from leftover parts and a couple new parts and that's my delta dagger guitar now so the whole second delta dagger record you're going to hear the strat on that Sick. um yeah, so that's how I got into I got into it out of necessity. I wanted a guitar that uh, did what I wanted it to, and every guitar I've built since has had at least small changes to make it the way I want it to be. Uh, it's something that you can't just go buy, and I like that they have personality to them because I built them. Definitely. Yeah, I remember the orange matte guitar very well. I would, I would say it definitely had a lot of personality, and uh, I guess I just associate it with those IV shows, so... It's good memories when I think of that guitar. Absolutely, dude. I'm glad. 
So what is something you would say that you've learned from the process that you wouldn't have otherwise known, I guess, or like the biggest thing you could think of? Ah, yes. Well, the biggest thing I learned is that the Squire Affinity Stratocaster body is a quarter inch thinner than a normal Stratocaster body. So anytime you go to buy parts that are marked for Stratocaster, they're not going to fit. You have to improvise. (laughs) Crucial. (laughs) Uh, No, seriously, what did I learn? Um... I, I guess I learned what makes a guitar tick. Uh, that's kind of dumb. That's a really cheesy thing to say. I love um, cheesy lines. <laughs> I guess what I learned is that I enjoy uh, building the tools for my job uh, uh, and kind of doing it myself. Um, it, it plays into another passion of mine when you ask about like what what does Delta Dagger do for me? It's the same thing that building a guitar does for me. And and, uh, you know, when I was little, like one of my favorite toys was Legos. And I just loved having all the pieces and you can see in your mind what it's going to be. And then you build it. And it's like the same thing when I'm recording a song. Like I said, you have the sounds in your mind and then you get to build it. You get to make those real. And the same thing with a guitar. It's like, dude, this next album, I can't be using these humbuckers. I don't want that tone. I want a Strat tone. I really want that Stratocaster mid scoop. Nice. I'm going to build a Stratocaster now. I have a Stratocaster body lying around, don't I? And now I just built a Stratocaster. It's real. So it's like, uh, it's just highly satisfying to me in that way. That's awesome. I love that metaphor. I've never heard somebody draw the connection between Legos and music yet. And that makes me really happy. Oh, dude, when you open GarageBand and it's like a green brick and then the next track is like a blue brick and then oh, oh, man. Dude, it's, it's hiding right in front of you, man. It's like the Illuminati. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to not think of that now. That's awesome. (laughs) Um, So for everybody who does not have any familiarity with IV, I like to ask everybody who was part of that scene to kind of describe it in their own words. So what what was IV like for you? Oh, dude. IV, it's hard to beat Robert's description of it where you just go with a very literal like it's a square mile of 25,000 college kids on the beach that's IV like you know and like yeah. everything to unpack there like that is IV what I thought was really unique about IV that I don't see really anywhere there's a little bit of it up here in slow but I loved the the scene that we had um I think our generation in particular, and it's so biased to say that because I don't know what the last generation was doing and I don't know what the current generation is doing, but (laughs) I felt like our generation had a really cool like music scene. I feel like uh, it, it was to a point where we literally had to have like, we had to text all the other bands and be like, okay, so you're playing two Saturdays from now. Okay. I'm going to schedule my show on this Saturday then, or like, Oh, okay. So I can play Friday night of that weekend, but you guys are going to play Saturday. Oh, could we just come open? It was like, every band was like connected. There was a show every night, every weekend, often more than one show. Everybody was hammered, fucked up, having a great time. It was good vibes, awesome mosh pits, but like good mosh pits. And like, a ton of cool music like it always blew my mind that we could have bands like savage henry playing you know just straight rock uh and like frisian doing the kind of uh alt rock thing and then like the hypno rings are doing like frank zappa songs and like extended jams and like those every single one of those shows would be packed and then there's like rabbit's foot which is like experimental like noise pop like that oh my god dude it was so cool it was yeah. so cool. I love your description. That was fantastic. Thanks, dude. You, you just gave me the chills a little bit. I'm on my second doobie of the conversation, so. <laughs> there you go. That's perfect. So outside of IV, Aiden was also curious to hear what your favorite venue was to play at in Santa Barbara, maybe like downtown. Oh, Soho. Soho. No, no contest. Soho was highly professional. They paid you well. Uh, the sound was always good. Uh, the the you got a high caliber of musicians in there. Uh, the crowd was always sick. I it to me was head and shoulders above every other uh, like downtown uh, venue. Um, yeah, that one to me immediately comes to mind. Yeah, that's a quality venue. I, I like yeah. that answer. So. We will switch gears a little bit. I want to hear, this is a question I ask basically every guest because it's a fun question. 
I want to know what your favorite original song of your own is and why. Ooh, well, my my agents tell me to say count to four. <laughs> That's the single. <laughs> my my publicity people want me to push that one right now. Um, that's a, no, I, that I do have a really soft spot for that song. I think it might be my best song, even though it's not like my best song. I think it's like it's what my publicity people want me to say my best song is. So <laughs> I think I think as of what I've released, <clears throat> I think the best one holistically is Firelight. Um, I think the best one from a pure musical standpoint is Daft Drunk. Uh, I think count to four is just that's the single man. That's the one you gotta say. Yeah, I get you. And you just said two of the three of the songs I want to put on this episode being hell count yeah. to four and Daft Drunk. Oh hell yeah! You said you had a story for Daft Drunk, and I don't even know how to set it up. So maybe you can just tell us the story. Oh, I, I can jump in, and that's it's perfect timing because now the audience, even if they're not uh, acquainted with me, have all the backstory. So basically. That's the album opener, right? So that's the first song on the first Delta Dagger record. And I knew that a lot of people listening to that record were listening to it because they knew me from Savage Henry. So this album for a lot of people was the the preconceived notion is this is the guitar player from Savage Henry's solo record. So just those words, guitar player and Savage Henry already have such a weight on your expectations for this album uh that i had to crush them i had to crush them (laughs) (laughs) well but first i had to tease them so the song opens with a synth pad and a guitar solo right so basically if you're listening to this with that preconceived notion you're like yeah this is exactly what i expected it's uh literally just two synth chords and a fat guitar solo okay this is like a little bit more obnoxious than i even expected geez like this is over the top uh that's the point and then the rest of the band comes in, which it's Will Heddle on drums. Those are his real drums uh, and some like arpeggios and stuff, kind of synth arpeggios. So then it's like, but more guitar soloing. So then it's kind of like, OK, well, this is a different texture. You know, Savage Henry didn't do any synth arpeggios. It's kind of weird, uh, but it's still, you know, pretty much within the realm of what I was imagining. And then the final third of the song, which I think is the best part of the song by far, uh, the distorted guitar disappears. You get two uh, quiet, um, clean electric guitars uh, panned hard right and hard left. So it's no longer the central crazy guitar solo. You get a a grand piano uh, centered uh, and a slap bass line. And that's so basically I'm I literally put the guitars to the side and centered piano and bass, which I do not really know how to play but the whole point was to be like this is the new thing like you're gonna hear new sounds there are gonna be times when the crazy guitar solo gets put aside and we're gonna focus on other things here like i'm glad you liked savage henry welcome to delta dagger hell yeah i would say that you accomplished that goal of kind of just teasing the expectations and then kind of destroying them that's uh, you kind of described how i felt when i listened to the song honestly so hell yeah Hell yeah, dude. Yeah. I mean, I'm partial as a bass player, but I love the slap bass in there, too. It's so good. Hell yes, dude. Oh, I'm glad you liked it. That means a lot, dude, because I that's the only slap bass thing I've ever done, and I was just, like, trying to figure it out, so. <laughs> you, you pulled it off. Okay. So next, here's another kind of fun question, and it can go a lot of different ways, but do you have any guilty listening pleasures? Um, I don't even know if I'd call it guilty. I, the obvious answer is, um, I really like, uh, songs about Jane, that whole record Maroon five, um, excellent record. I think, uh, some of those guitar riffs like on shiver are highly overlooked in the guitar community. Um, and I just think it's good pop music, dude. I think it's really good. Um, the rest of their stuff, not so much. Um, but songs about Jane, man, that is a, I'd say that's probably a, I guess that's a guilty pleasure. Not even really. I don't know. You don't have to be guilty about it, but it, it fits what I was looking for. Basically, Good. it's just kind of like unexpected, not the usual answer of, of what you are enjoying. Hell yeah. 
So, uh, non-guilty listening, what kind of music are you into right now? Um, right now, on the way home tonight, I was listening to uh, Owain. Owain is a, a Norwegian guy who just like records like crazy guitar shit. Basically, he plays guitar, keyboard, and bass, and he's like insanely talented at all three. And then he has his buddy who plays drums, and it's like like his earlier things are like a little more metal. It's like prog metal. Um, kind of like, do you listen to like Pliny at all? No, I'm not familiar. No. Or like, um, what's he kind of like, I don't know. It's like not quite like Chon. It's like a little more like metal than that. Okay. Um, but then his newest thing that he, his, his newest album is like, like Steely Dan meets Chon meets, uh, the, original soundtrack to ace combat four on playstation 2 like it's it's like <laughs> the coolest fucking thing ever and i'm obsessed with it and i'd be lying if i if i uh if i said i didn't uh draw inspiration from that in my current music um so you know lots of stuff like that the new chon record uh speaking of chon i was obsessed with that for so long after it came out um probably my favorite album of theirs um what else have I had on lately? I, let me go on to my Spotify. I can't even think. There you go. Um, actually, no, good one. Uh, good one to bring up. I almost brought them up earlier. Um, uh, it, they're called The Cleaners from Venus. Have you seen these guys? The Cleaners from Venus? No, not yet. Okay, so it's basically this dude. His name's Martin Newell, and he's this British guy. And like, if you literally go on Spotify right now and type in The Cleaners from Venus and go to their discography – and scroll like all the way down there's like freaking 40 albums on there and the first one's like 1978 and the newest one is literally i wouldn't be surprised if he already had one in 2020 actually i need to look at that i'm not gonna look at it but there he literally had like christmas 2019 he put out like a song or two yeah um he's just this old british guy he fucking recorded all of it himself like he was back there in 1978 with whatever the hell kind of i don't even know man what kind of tape recorder or whatever they had uh, and he's just like jamming it out and it's it's brit pop it's super cool if you like the beatles or the clash or the smiths uh, you know and that's a huge range of bands and genres and eras but i swear to god if you go listen to his stuff you will hear elements of all of that in there and if you like those three bands you will freaking love this guy and i'm obsessed with him now he has such a huge discography anytime i get bored of one of his albums i just pick the next one and it's full of bangers and it's awesome that's sick yeah i'm looking at it right now i'm scrolling and i'm scrolling and i'm scrolling yeah He's like somehow associated with Burger Records right now. Huh. I don't know how exactly, but like he's like, was it Burger Records? He's like associated with something like that. It's if it's not Burger Records, it's something similar. But he's like low key, like kind of on a weird come up. I don't know. It, it's super cool. It's totally worth checking out. Perfect. I'm going to check it out. Half the reason I do this is just to find new music to listen to. Exactly. There you go, dude. Get it right from the source. Very nice. Well, you had your Spotify out. This is a fun question. Sometimes I do it at the end, but I like to know what the last song you saved was. Oh, the last song I saved. That's the very oh, last one. I don't even know. That's in the folder. It just says liked. Yeah, just liked. liked yeah, well, I guess the song you only, liked. Yeah, there's only two, 22. The last one was a Home Shake song. Give it to me, Home Shake. I love Home Shake. Yeah, he's sick. Let me see if I can find like a funny one. Uh, maybe something you added to a playlist too. I don't know how you handle your music, so people do it differently. Yeah, I just I don't even utilize a lot of these features. I kind of just uh, like put on an album and just like listen to it. I don't know. I'm going to have to play with this a little more. Some of these songs I don't even remember faving. I'm going to have to go back and uh, revisit them. That's what I love. I love just like saving something. A lot of times for me it happens with Shazam. I'll Shazam a bunch of songs. I don't know how much you use that app. but oh, I'm then it'll, constantly on there. Yeah, I just like to wait. I like to store up like 20, 30 songs before I actually go back and re-listen. And then I've just got like a sick playlist of like 30 songs from the last couple months and it's so fun what was my how wait how do i look at my last shazam no i don't want that's actually a good one hang on is it library is that where it is or yeah i think so 
Library. Yeah, library. Oh, here we go. Yeah, the last song yeah. was uh, Terrapin by Bonobo. Oh, yeah, I like Bonobo. Oh. Yeah, yeah nice. I I, uh, I had heard of Bonobo, but I was standing in uh, Chipotle and this song was playing Terrapin. <laughs> and I was like vibing to it. I was like, dude, this is sick. And I took it. I was like, oh, Bonobo. I've heard of these guys. So, yeah, that was my last Shazam. That's great. And a Chipotle. I love just random music in the wild. Yeah, dude. I uh craziest moment. So my buddy Joaquin, who I went to, he was uh one of my like freshman year roommates, um, has like the most obscure taste in music. He's like like the most hipster dude ever, but totally not trying to be, like totally sincere about it. And he sent me uh he had he had sent me a couple of these really cool like bossa artists. Uh and the most recent one he had sent me uh, was this guy called uh, Erasmo Carlos. And I walk into a, it was same thing. This was probably like a year ago. And I walk into like a same thing, like a Chipotle or something. I'm like standing in line on my lunch break at some like restaurant. I'm like, where do I know this song from? And then I'm like, dude, freaking Chipotle is playing Erasmo Carlos, like obscure, like, bossa slash pop like what the fuck it was the weirdest moment man it was crazy yeah that's cool that actually reminded me i was just looking at it i actually came across an erasmo carlos song also vita no Ante- vita antigua or antigua i don't know how to pronounce I, it i've totally seen that title i couldn't tell you which one that is but that's uh it must be more common than i think yeah but it's like right in that sweet spot of mm-hmm. like you don't hear it enough but i guess that's a good thing here's th- here's the one i've never heard out in the wild and if you like erasmo carlos you will love this guy uh, his name is arthur verakai he was portuguese kind of bossa yeah. stuff have you you know him i think i know something from him his 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 eponymous album is stellar he did uh television scores for uh porch or uh, brazilian television and then he was a like a boss a guy too so he kind of combines it in a really cool way on that record it's a very cool one yeah i like that stuff that's a good stuff yeah. yeah okay here's a good question for you you've played a ton of shows over your years i'm curious about this with all performers but what do you do to prepare for a show whether it be in terms of the music and just like physically and mentally yeah i mean I'm a big proponent of practicing. Um, my new strat, I put a fake uh, inlay on the 12th fret that just says practice in like aerial font. It's literally there to force me to practice. Um, so I'm a big proponent of practicing before a gig. I know a lot of bands, especially in the IV scene, it's easy to just be like, dude, we're just a drunk IV band. Like we're not going to fucking practice. Like everyone's going to be drunk. It's not going to matter. Right. Um but like I'm a big proponent of practicing even for a it's going to be a 30 minute set, dude. Like we're fine. We don't need to pray. It's fine, dude. Come on. There's like not going to be anyone there. No, nah, fuck that, dude. If you're going to play a live set, you need to at least pay it the respect of practicing for it. Um, I say this as literally Friday. I'm going to get like one practice in with my live version of Delta Dagger and go play a show. But at least we're getting one practice, you know? Yeah. One's That's better than none. Thing. Um, so go basically the practice lets you go into it. Like you've been there before, even if you haven't, it lets you go into it with that confidence, um, which is what you need when you go on stage. You need to have a certain level of confidence and a certain level of swagger. You have to put yourself in that mindset a little bit because, you know, you're, you're there to perform, you're there to entertain. Um, and at the same time, you're like really vulnerable too, though. (laughs) That's the hard part. You have to. You have to put on the confident face and have the stage presence to not look insecure when you're being vulnerable, if that makes sense. Um, Because you're up there doing this thing you practice so hard for and you poured all your your time and your emotion into it. And it's if you're writing lyrics, it might be stuff that that means something to you. Or even if you're not, even instrumental music can mean something to you. And you're going to go show it to a bunch of people. And there's a good chance that they're going to be super drunk and not care and not be into it. And it's, so you have to put on the uh, brave face and go out there and 
if you're lucky, you can make him be into it, right? Um, all that being said, uh, the the nutshell version of that is you basically have to get drunk before the show. So that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> the, to sum that all up, you got to get drunk. At least a little bit, right? At least a little bit. You got to loosen Because you can be vulnerable and heartfelt and also a macho dumbass. So there you go. It's perfect. There you go. You should name <laughs> uh, your next album Macho Dumbass. Macho Dumbass. That's actually a great album. Oh, I'm going to write that down. I have a little... The the album name, if I, if I could give you a sneak peek, is currently brow heist 2006 Ooh. if any of your uh, listeners can get that reference i'll uh, send you a delta dagger sticker um sure. let me put delta where did, where did challenge that has been announced get on it brow heist 2006 but I'm, I'm writing that in my notes right now what macho dumbass yeah that's great dude your that's, words man your words macho dumbass. all right that's in my phone now i like that's what you said before too that's good it's kind of interesting at least in my experience, I kind of compartmentalize my stage self and my regular self. It's almost, I mean, for me, I don't know about you, but it's like a little bit of acting where I kind of like just channel a different side of myself, I guess, actually. Absolutely, dude. That's absolutely right. That's a much more concise way of saying what I was rambling about. <laughs> I mean, this is a podcast. We are here to ramble. We get to ramble. That's right. That's that is right. That's the whole point. Uh, speaking of which, have you tried a Quip toothbrush? It's the new subscription service. I'm just fucking around. <laughs> I was like excited. I'm like, ooh, we're going to get some money on this yeah, one. What are these? No, wait, what? <laughs> You lined something up? Sweet. <laughs> yeah, dude. Like I said, man, Delta Dagger puts the bread on the table, dude. Hey, I, I will keep coming back to you then. We'll just do every episode Delta Dagger. Uh, I'm I'm with it, dude. <laughs> okay. Well, let's uh, transition and get deep for a second. Because the the real purpose of this podcast is to ramble about the deep topic that is the point of making music, kind of what it means to be a musician. I want to hear your take. Why do you make music? Um, I actually had a joke answer for this, but I think it, it deserves a little more respect than that. (laughs) It's a good respect my show. Come on. (laughs) (laughs) I was totally ready to deliver this joke, but I, you know what? That's a good question. Um, I think I went into it a little bit before uh music's been with me forever to the point of having uh you know like i said these memories of my dad wrenching on something in the garage with klos on in the background or like driving around in the car uh with my mom and my brother listening to bowie or like you know i was taking guitar lessons a little later and then the bands i played in throughout high school and college and now it's like it's just like it ties me to so many memories throughout my life. It's definitely part of how I define myself and see myself uh, because it's been with me so for so long. So it's something that I, I I couldn't even quit if I wanted to. If I were if I were ever to quit, it'd be like a, a complete change of identity for me. You know, um, it'd be like if I just like shaved my head, but like more extreme than that. That's not even as extreme as that. That's not even as extreme of a personality change or, or change to who you are i don't know it's it's something really deep um why do i do it though you could ask the question of well why did i do it when i was in high school why did i do it um it's fun it's something that i think um like i said it stimulates my brain in a lot of really unique ways that i don't get elsewhere be it uh, you know building and kind of getting to exercise that creativity, uh, the spontaneity of being able to jam on the spot and kind of the, uh, camaraderie and the connection you get with someone else. It's like something else. It's, it's like, it, you know, it'd be like asking someone like, well, what's it like to be in love? I, I mean, I don't know. We've written like a million songs about it, but I still can't really tell you what it is unless you've experienced it too. It's like, if I'm on stage jamming with someone, it's like another emotion like that. And it's, you know, not something you can just like describe to someone, you know, like you've probably had it. You've had those moments with your band where you just fell into a groove and everything was just right. And the alcohol is hitting right. Like it should. And the 
crowds loving it and it's just this moment of like serenity and pure bliss you know it's like everything is perfect everything's firing on all cylinders i love it man it's a it's an unbelievable feeling and it's i guess i'm just chasing that dragon that's why i do it absolutely i love it amen that was a very nice profound answer Dude, I'm glad you coaxed it out of me because you know what I was going to say? I want to hear the joke, yeah. I was going to say to get laid. <laughs> Zing. Isn't that what we're all in it for at the end of the day? Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, the that's... money, the women, the alcohol, the drugs, the fame. Yeah, those are the things that really matter. We all know that. Exactly. We do it to get rich. We do it for the girls. We do it to piss off our moms. <laughs> That's good. It's you've just you've just uncovered my deepest my deepest truths. <laughs> so here we go. I'm gonna, we're gonna go back and get deep again. Mm-hmm. Do you ever feel like you're wasting your time playing music? Uh, well, uh, yes and no. Like the true answer is no, absolutely not. I don't feel like I'm wasting a second that I'm doing that. Um, Then there's like the pragmatic me that's like, well, you know, anytime I'm playing music, I'm not working on my career, I guess. Um, You know, there's like that side of me. There's that side of me that says, well, if I just, you know, dropped it all and went to go play music, I'd probably fail and then have to come crawling back to find a real job and explain why I went and pursued music for however long you know like there's that sense of it too like you kind of see yourself from how like society sees it society man society Um, (laughs) society, bro um so like in a sense in like a meta sense at times i feel like i'm wasting my time like i said times i'll put it this way at at times i think it feels kind of childish um you know especially like now if i'm playing a show and there's like no one there it's like wow like this isn't even as sick as when i was like in college in iv and like i'm still doing this so like there are times where it feels kind of weird like that um but it never that feeling never lasts for long um you always wind up finding other musicians and other people who appreciated the set and uh it always puts a smile on my face and i you know i think back to the early days of even in iv we played tons of shows to a shitty backyard full of nobody like there's no shame in starting there um so even though it's like dude i'm 25 like what am i doing like uh, sometimes that creeps in it's like dude i should be like doing more like professional things and stuff but like dude fuck that like when i'm on my deathbed i'm not gonna be like i wish i had like been more professional throughout my life i wish i had like you know like fuck that dude Uh, um so i definitely have the doubt i definitely have the self-doubt and the you know, I understand that chances are <laughs> if I were to just full on pursue it, nothing would happen. It's it's such a, a far fetched thing, uh, but that doesn't make it not worthwhile. I think the, the big thing that keeps me going, too, is wherever I wind up, I want to retire um, and be semi retired and just like build guitars. And that's what I would do. And that's kind of what keeps me going. You know, it's like, dude, I will die with a guitar in my hand. I love the way you ended it. I will die with a guitar in my hand. <laughs> just don't make me do it too soon. Don't make me do it with you. <laughs> We're just going to cut the podcast off after that line. Cool. No, not really. Oh. <laughs> you have to answer some more silly, dumb questions. Do it. Send me. them my way. Okay. these We're just going to get uh, silly. So who's your biggest fan? Uh, monetarily, my mom, I think spiritually, probably myself. (laughs) Those are the best answers. I I don't know. I don't know if anyone's like that seriously listening to Delta Dagger, um, to even be on the same level as my mom or me. (laughs) I mean, debatably, it's impossible to get on that level. I would say, though, that there was probably a couple people I knew who were bigger fans of Savage Henry than I was. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah. I, so I've not reached that level with Delta Dagger. <laughs> At least I don't think so. Well, yeah, we don't really know. If you're out there, reveal yourself. Please, please tell me. I'll send you a Delta Dagger shirt. Ooh, a shirt on the line now. Yeah. 
We got a lot of swag on the line. Stickers, shirts. We're going to get some interaction out of these listeners. I know. That's what my marketing people told me. We had to push the stickers and the shirts. We're already out of the snapbacks and the koozies, but uh, the stickers and shirts, we need to move. Ah, damn. You had snapbacks. (laughs) We did. They sold out fast, dude. Yeah, that's good. That's a good idea. So besides your job at Enterprise and playing music what do you what do you enjoy doing in your free time besides playing music um yeah besides the i mean yeah the again the joke answer is instead of playing music i'm recording music or building the guitar no but serious answer <laughs> is that <laughs> the, the serious answer is that i recently took up photography um i figured uh music uh has the opportunity to be like my alone time when i'm alone recording or whatever uh, but I needed something that got me outside more often than a gig once every three weeks. Uh, so I took up photography. I'm up here on the central coast in beautiful San Luis Obispo and perfect opportunity to get out and take some pictures of some stunning landscapes and other stuff like that. And um, I actually started messing around with photography and IV. Um, I got a, a little uh, Fuji film like instant camera just for like fun at parties and stuff. But I started like going around IV and just like taking like artsy little uh you know i guess you could kind of call it like lamography type stuff of like you know just like the park benches or the beach or like whatever like just whatever caught my eye like cool cars whatever and like it it became really fun like i started doing it just as like a gag or whatever uh but i started to get like a little more serious about it after i moved up here to slow um i bought a uh, 35 millimeter point and shoot camera so you know it's a point shoot. It's pretty easy, but the 35 millimeters, like a step up from the instant film and took some really cool photos with that. Uh, it got stolen though, along with like five rolls of undeveloped film recently. So super oh, pissed about that. So uh, I'm in the market for a new camera. If anybody out there is uh, selling a 35 millimeter camera, let me know. Uh, <laughs> that could be go. another thing. <laughs> He'll trade so, you a uh, sticker. I'll, I'll trade you one sticker for a camera. <laughs> It'll be a special. I'll sign the sticker. Oh, shit. Okay, maybe <laughs> two cameras then. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been messing around a little bit with photography. I'm still learning, though. That's cool. That's but, great, man. That's my new thing. I want to ha- I want to see some pictures. Yeah, dude. I, I could show you a couple. The, if I do wind up releasing this other thing that I recorded and didn't like... The album cover is going to be a, a Polaroid I took from uh, from Togapalooza, actually. Oh, shit. Oh, do it. You got to do it. Uh, I got to do it now, right? I teased more, it too much. More nagging and pressure from me. <laughs> it's all right. You nag me. I'll nag somebody. We'll all nag each other into creating music. Yes, more good things will happen. <laughs> I'm always a proponent of releasing like as much as possible. I want to hear it all. Yeah. Yeah, in a in like on paper, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> it's harder when it's your own stuff. Exactly. <laughs> I'll I'll have to put it out there. Nah, it's time. It's time it happened. It's time tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this weekend. I don't know. <laughs> we'll think about it. Okay. What's the best concert you've ever been to as a fan? Ooh. Um Boy, there's so many ways I could go with this. I think the best, uh, the best show I ever saw, like the best show, was when I went and saw uh, Pink Floyd do the Wall, or I well not Pink Floyd, Roger Waters did the Wall, yeah, with an excellent backing band, G. E. Smith, and uh, uh, I, I mean, he had an excellent backing band. Um, so I saw him do the wall concert. That was incredible. And just in terms of a pure show experience, that was probably the best. Um, uh, just the cool effects and visuals and stuff. And I mean, it was very cool. Plus, I was always a huge Floyd fan. And the wall got me through some tough times in middle school, man. <laughs> so to go out there and see it. 
I was like, whoa, this is so cool. It's like scenes you'd kind of put together in your head before as you listen to the album, like how would it play out, you know, and then you get to see it. It's like, whoa, oh, that yeah. was probably the sickest show I've ever seen. Just in terms of like show experience, uh, like I guess visually or just as the sort of production of the show. Um, but like, I mean, some of the best shows I've ever been to in terms of just like pure fun I had were like, shoot like walter mitty and his makeshift orchestra with diners at vlhs which was a class c like industrial building uh in an industrial park in freaking pomona and they would lift up the door on the industrial building and like they had concerts in there and it was like sick as fuck and like super diy super like you know uh, but like so much fun, dude, so much fun. So like I, you could go like probably the most expensive concert I've ever seen to the one that like costs nothing. Uh, and like, I don't know, man, I feel like I'm rambling. <laughs> I want you to ramble. This is, this is a podcast. <laughs> That's right. Ramble. Yeah, we do have to ramble. God, sometimes I'm listening to a podcast and I'm just like 15 seconds forward, 15 seconds forward, 50 seconds forward. They're still talking about the shit. 15 seconds. Come on. Come on. Like, just fucking come on. Well, it, you know, they have that power. If they're bored, they could skip forward. No, that's true. They can do it. Too. For every person skipping forward, there's another person going like, oh, shit. Yes. Like, totally. Like, on the same <laughs> wavelength and, like, wants to hear more. Yeah. I guess that's true. You can pick and choose. You can. But, of course, with my show, nobody skips forward because it's so good. That's right, dude. You're hanging on every word. I know. Okay. Those are those are great answers. I love the uh, juxtaposition of the cost and like situation and they both were impactful. That's that's really cool. Yeah. So we will end with a game. Uh, a game of my own creation that I've been doing the last few episodes. It's called Soundtrack to Your Life. Basically, I'm gonna read you a scenario as if you are in a movie. And you're going to tell me what song is playing in the background. Gotcha. Are you prepared and willing? Yes and yes. Okay, good. I put a little more effort into it this time. So I wrote like real scenes. And it's not I just never, I never, I'll be honest with you. I listened to a couple of your episodes, but they were early ones. So I have, I was totally not expecting this. Yeah, yeah. This is, <laughs> yeah, really, this is kind of I'm a really new, ready. this is cool. It's a new thing. I've only done it a couple of times, but okay, here we go. Scene one. Flashback to high school. You're in the hallway by your locker. Graduation is a week away, and the girl you've been secretly crushing on for years comes up to you out of nowhere and professes her love to you. What song is playing in the background? Ooh. You could take a minute, too. I could stall for you. I thought you were going to go One Direction with the end of that, and I already had a song, but then I was like, oh, no, this is different. This is a different song. Dude, different. the first one the first one that came to mind uh, for this scenario, the one that immediately hopped into my head was uh, Hand in Glove by the Smiths. There you um, go. Because it is, uh, like many Smith songs, so bright and optimistic about love. But then if you listen to it a little more closely, it's actually like really sarcastic and he's like shitting on love, which is <laughs> I feel like that's, you know, that high school relationship, last day of school, graduation. That's how you think it's going to be, man. You think it's going to be this fairy tale thing, just like in the movies. Then you both go off to college and now it's different. You know, things are different now in that relationship. Who knows what's going to happen now? So it's like I, I'll stick with that one. That's a good one. That is a good one. That's fan- that's like better than I expected. I, I like how you took it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Scene two. It's Saturday night, and you've downed about five to six drinks in the pregame. You and your friends <laughs> go out. You hit some bars. One of those bars happens to have a mechanical bull in the back, and it's calling your name. Your friends challenge you to hop on. What song is playing in the background as you ride the bull? Ooh, this has got to be like fucking... Uh... Oh, what's uh, what's the Skinnerd song? Um, like, they call me the Breeze by Leonard Skinnerd. There you go. That would be the fucking song. Dude. That's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Scene three. This one's the most depressing. Well, I shouldn't say that. I don't want to give you expectations. Scene three. <laughs> You're forty-seven years old. 
unmarried, no kids. Your parents have disowned you after years of drug abuse. It's a cold Wednesday night in January, and you find yourself in Las Vegas, your favorite city, gambling away your last $40, playing roulette at the Silver Sevens Hotel and Casino. You've got nowhere to go or stay. You cross the street, lock yourself in the bathroom of a Panera Bread, and begin to cry. What song is playing in the background? Uh, uh, Symphony by Bonobo, I guess. <laughs> Call back. <laughs> that was a perfect way to end it. I had to throw I you. I was like, Panera Bread, we talked about this. Wait. <laughs> I told you I was going to ask you this question. You got to be prepared. <laughs> Okay, please, John, it's been a pleasure. Would you possibly do me the honor of recommending somebody else who could be a good guest for this show? Absolutely, dude. You got to talk to, and I I think this will be your first double interview, but you got to get Max Schultz and uh, Vincent Brock on your show from Feral Vita. Um, Oh, yeah. Some old Ivy homies, dude. They're still making music, and... um, something cool about their band i feel like every time i saw them they were like a little bit better than the last time which i fucking respect the hell out of that's so cool and the last show i saw of theirs was like two weeks ago in iv funny enough i went and saw them and they were like so fucking good dude i mean they've always been really good but like this show in particular just really knocks my socks off um and I think they're still around Santa Barbara. So it'd be so cool if you could get those guys on there uh, and just talk to them about their process and what they're doing. And and I would love to hear that interview. Oh, yeah. I, dude, I agree with you. I felt the same way over the few times that I saw them. I felt like they did improve like each time. Yeah, which is fucking awesome, dude. That's, um, that's something I really hope people see in my music too is that every time i put something out it's better than the last thing um that's something i see in some music jeff beck is like that a lot if you listen to some of his stuff i feel like he's a better guitar player now at age 75 than he was at age 25 which i think is cool as fuck and i really hope that that happens to me too you know so i I respect the hell out of that hey it better happen i'm gonna be keeping tabs on you yeah (laughs) good like i said keep nagging okay uh where could people find you shout out all your social medias and places people can listen to your music oh yeah so uh at delta dagger music on instagram that's like mainly where i'm at uh i don't have a like personal instagram so i post some personal stuff on there too so just yeah like dm me or follow me i follow back um and then Spotify probably you should actually probably go go to Spotify to check it out. I'm on everything like Robert said, everything that Distro Kid put me on, that's what I'm on. Hell so, yeah. So like Spotify is usually what I show people cuz it's pretty accessible. Um but if you're a real freaking homie, you go to the Bandcamp cuz there's a song, there's a special bonus track to the Delta Dagger album that's only available on Bandcamp. Spotify wouldn't let me post it. So, uh if you're a real super fan you can go and uh and check that out the Bandcamp exclusive damn wait why mm-hmm. didn't spotify let you post it i'm curious uh copyright things uh, okay. I, I sampled a bunch of uh simpsons oh are you, are you aware of uh simpsons wave i want to be deep <laughs> <laughs> all right you need to <laughs> You need to be like me and smoke two joints and just look up Simpsons Wave on YouTube and watch the videos. So, you you know, like Vaporwave, right? Yeah, yeah. I like Vaporwave, so yeah. People started taking like Vaporwave songs and then like doing like edits of like Simpsons clips to like go along with the song. But it's like, you know, it's like the chill hip hop beats to study to and it's like some little anime thing. But it's like the Simpsons. And so <laughs> then there were Simpsons Wave. I'm going to have to link you. There's one in particular that's so good. I have to link it to you. Anyways, there's like Simpsons Wave. So I was like, oh, dude, I'm going to do a Simpsons Wave song. So I took Firelight uh, 
and then I remixed it as a Simpsons Wave song. So <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't post it on uh, on uh, Spotify, which sucks because it actually gives very good closure to the album because it's a uh, very very uh, '80s uh, arpeggiated keyboard with big reverb guitar solo over it but it's just a snippet of a guitar solo repeated so it's kind of a callback to daft drunk you know it's kind of this yeah weird stony uh, perverted version of that song and firelight almost and that's how you end the album it's like i don't know it's kind of a fun one i'm gonna have to go check it out you gotta go check it out dude it's pretty fun and now i know how i'm gonna spend the rest of my night there you go absolutely and while we're here, we mentioned Vaporwave. I'm going to do a shameless plug for a previous episode, episode seven. And it's also just a plug for this guy. His name is Twanner. He makes dope Vaporwave music. You and all the listeners should go check out Twanner. I'm going to check that out. It's good That's stuff. How I'm spending the rest of my night. There you go. You're welcome. All right, John, keep making cool shit. I will. Don't ever stop. And uh, we always end with a high five. Are you ready? Yes. Three, two, one. Right on oh, time. Exactly. We can we can fix that in post. We'll fix it. We won't. Just fix add it. an eight oh eight. You should you should do like an eight oh eight sound effect. Three, two, one. Just I should just start adding in like <laughs> completely random sound effects. Or or pitch shift. Do like a huge like octave drop on our voices for a quick second. Like, like, right here, you can take it down like an octave and then, and then put like a ton of delay, 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 a ton of delay. All right, I'm going to put, I'm going to put these on, on my list of things to do. And it's, it's, this is all going, I'm not editing any of this out also. This is all going in the episode. This is the best part of the conversation. Thank you for being on. Goodbye now, John. Goodbye, 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 goodbye.
Hey guys, Aiden here. Thanks again so much for listening. Be sure to like and share this podcast with all of your friends and follow us on social media at Redefining Records as well as on all of your listening platforms as we've got a lot of cool projects coming up. See you guys soon.